ladies and gentlemen, we are live. This is the 2020 Distressed Note Convention, and we are so excited. If you're tuning in, I promise you, if you have any questions about notes, about life, and about how to crush it, this is the expo you need to be on. We got my man, very special guest. Now, keep in mind, guys, I'm a young guy in the business, okay? And if you talk to some of the top guys, you know, there's guys like Steve Lloyd, Nick Tang, who's running the show. And let me tell you, they all have high honors and high praises for the one, for the only, Dave Van Horn. Okay, he's going to crush it today. Dave, we're so excited to have you. We're so grateful to be on this show with you. And ladies and gentlemen, if you're tuning in, make some noise. Use this comment section. This is where we are to network. Okay, make sure you guys are posting all your questions because I know you're going to have a lot for our special guest. Dave, how are you feeling today? I'm feeling unbelievable. <laughs> I'm ready to take on the world. Living my best are... life. Like Steve Lloyd, I'm living my best life. <laughs> <laughs> little, little uh, side, side hey, thanks right for now. the great intro. Uh, I really appreciate that. So uh, now I got, uh, I got a lot to live up to here. So, <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, Dave, I'm going to let you run the show. Um, just a few quick important notes for anyone who's tuning in right now. Wow, we have a lot of people jumping in. We have like <laughs> over 30 people already on this call. So listen, guys, very important notes, okay? You guys are going to have questions, and we want to get your questions answered. So please do us a huge favor. Anytime something comes to your mind or anything you want to say, right, put it in the comment section. Dave has access to that, and Dave's going to be able to read your questions and Dave's going to be answering all your guys' questions at the end. And whether you're brand new or whether you're super experienced, Dave is the guy to ask your question. So please make sure you pin your question in the comment section um, and we will uh, get those answered for you. That's our job as, um, you know, us hosting the event today. So please make sure you pin your questions in the comment section. Dave's going to get those answered. Let's do a quick little uh, practice round of that. Okay. If you're tuning in, post in the comment section right now one thing that you're excited to learn. Post in the comment section right now one thing you're excited to learn from Dave, and let's pin it up. All right? I got a few more seconds here before I get kicked out, and Dave's going to be solo. He's going to be crushing it. But post in the comment section right now. Let us know something that you're excited to learn. Uh, if you're not excited to learn anything, nothing wrong with that. You don't have to be. But just say what's up. At least give me a hi or a hello or a wave so I can know that you're here with us. All right? So let's get the let's get these uh, comments rolling. Put them in the comment section. Let's see them. Let's see them. Say hey. Say what's up. Let us know what you're excited to learn. Let's get this bad boy rolling. Here we go. <laughs> Look yeah. at this first comment. Come on. Yeah. Is a legend. So I can't pick one. That's not what Mrs. Van Horn says. <laughs> oh. uh, I love it. Oh, got a lot all right. Wow. Here. We got a lot of comments coming in here. Guys, keep the comments rolling. Keep the keep saying what's up. We got Leslie. She says, What should I do now in the market? Love the question. We're gonna, David, we're gonna talk a little bit about some of that. Yeah, yeah. That's all good. Boom. Love it. All right, guys, keep the comments coming. Keep the comments coming. Keep the questions coming. I want to make sure you guys are active. I want to make sure you guys are engaged. I want to make sure you guys are here with us because I promise you, I promise you, if you want to learn about the no business, okay, this is the guy. This is the guy to learn from, all right? So keep the questions. Keep the comments rolling. Um, here we go. Views on the current com economy. Jill, trust me, you are in the best place to learn about that, so get ready. <laughs> We got Angie in the house waving. What's up, Angie? All right, guys. So listen, I'm gonna hand it over to Dave. Dave, the show is yours. I'm heading out. All Dave, right, all right. I'll learn from you, baby. Let's get it. All right. All right, let's do this. All right. Um, what a great intro. Hey, thanks everybody for joining in today. I'm gonna be talking about note investing in the current economy. And before I get too far into it, I always like to start my talks off with a little. Uh, story about opportunity. And when I was um, eight years old, um, my dad left my mom 
with six kids. And um, when all my friends uh, were home in bed asleep uh, early in the morning, I was about the fourth grade. I was getting up a quarter to five to deliver the Philadelphia Inquirer, uh, which is a newspaper, by the way. Some people don't. I don't know if they still do that. <laughs> but anyhow, um, I didn't mind doing it. Uh, it was cool for me to be able to make a little bit of money and help my mom out and uh, be able to buy clothes and books and things like that. And um, I had pretty good grades in school. And when I was in eighth grade, my mom came to me with a unique opportunity. And the opportunity was, uh, you know, I was grew up outside Philadelphia. And the opportunity was to take an entrance exam to a private uh, college prep school down in Delaware which might as well have been Mars because you know how, you know, you get in a click around your neighborhood and things like that. So I was telling my mom, I was like, mom, you're crazy. You know, we can't afford it. I can't get in that school. You know, you know, all the, all these excuses. And my mom kind of tricked me. She said, uh, don't worry, you won't get in. Just try it and see how you'll do. So you kind of know where this story is going. I actually uh, went down, took the exam and I ended up getting a four year academic scholarship to this school. Um, it's actually where uh, Vice President Biden went to. And uh, what's interesting is uh, it completely changed my world because it changed my sphere of influence. And, uh, you know, I was lucky. I was fortunate. I was one of the only siblings that completed college. And, um, you know, uh, who is it? The preacher, like Joel Olstein, always says, are you ready to receive it today? And it's like when an opportunity comes your way, you have to be kind of ready to move on it. And that's kind of what happened with me with the note business. You know, I was a real estate investor. I was in real estate pretty heavy as an agent, a contractor, you know, all these different things. Um, I owned a title company, all kinds of stuff, property manager. And then the note opportunities came across my desk and it just kind of changed my world. But if you're not ready to receive it, it kind of won't happen, you know. And when I look at things today, you know, I am a, a, a fund manager. Uh, one of my roles is raising capital. I oversee investor relations. I oversee our marketing. I also oversee our REO department, which is uh, disposition of bank-owned property. And um, we've done over 9,000 loans at this point. Uh, we have 25 employees. And uh, so far this year, I've probably acquired right around 40 million in acquisitions this year. Uh, we just got named to the Inc. 5000, which is cool. We had 237% uh, growth in the last three years in our company. So it's pretty exciting times for us um, as a, you know, just as a fund manager. And we um, focus primarily on one to four family residential mortgages nationwide, first and second mortgages. We also have an arm that does uh, seed capital for hard money lending. And then we also have a... Uh, a division that does some like transactional funding for commercial stuff. So we, we have our hand in a couple of things. Um, I'm also known as dad and I'm a husband and uh, in some circles of, I'm known as G pop and uh, I actually have four grandkids. So life's good to me. And um, my one son's not in this picture. He actually, but he actually works at PPR. He's been with us for, I'd say, 11 years. He's our director of marketing, um, my son, Chris. So some of you may know Chris from some of the events we have. So um, the health and economic news, um, what's different this time around, I think, uh, you know, obviously PPR was started back in 2007. We're entering our 14th year. We were in an up market when we started in notes. In fact, I was introduced to distressed debt probably about three years before we started PPR. And, um, you know, we were definitely in an up market. The market tanked. Uh, so we've been through a couple cycles going back up to an up market. And now we have this economic decline, but it's government induced, which is much different. Um, and you can, you know, you can see where the government's playing, I don't want to say playing games with us, but in some ways they are with stimulus and lowering of interest rates, things like that. So it's a, it's a, it's an interesting time and there's a lot of moving parts. So it is tough to predict, uh, what's going on out there, but there is, um, you know, it's a health crisis. And my view on that is that you're going to need a health solution before we get all the way back to some degree of normalcy. And we're starting to see some of that. So I'm not trying to be pessimistic or anything like that. 
In fact, I'm quite optimistic, and a, a lot of good things have come out of a bit of a tough situation. And, um, and and sometimes that happens that way. But one of the things that's unique right now is you have a lot of cheap capital with these lower rates. So if you're not refinancing, or if you do find a deal, great time to finance a deal if it's really a deal. I'm actually liquidating a bunch of properties. Um, I'm doing a deal right now where I'm liquidating 14 of my own properties and I'm actually holding a, a good chunk of paper on that as well on a private uh, mortgage. So, um, but the one biggest economic indicator to the non-performing note business is unemployment, right? And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that. But unemployment is the biggest economic indicator. Now, obviously, that was at unprecedented levels. It's starting to come back down to a more palatable level. And uh, there's definitely going to be some fallout. And that's what the opportunity is going to be for us. Uh, we're already seeing margins widening. Uh, when the pandemic first hit, you saw a lot of tightening in the commercial markets, especially with lines of credit, especially with hard money lending. You saw all the aggregators um, some of them were collapsing and stopping doing business. Uh, we were actually fortunate. We picked up a couple of good trades during that. And, uh, we're, we're seeing, uh, definitely a widening of margins on some of the assets we're acquiring right now. Um, the residential real estate market though, has been pretty strong. I mean, it's a good time to still sell. And a lot of people are like, well, why is that? Well, you have a, you have like this, uh, I don't want to say perfect storm of, um, you know, it's still a seller's market, right? And you have a shortage of housing, you have cheap capital. And then there's something I think a lot of people may not be paying attention to or noticing, and it's family formation is way up. Family formations are way up. No one's talking about that. I don't know why. Um, and it's just like um, the boomers retiring, right? I'm uh, Technically, I'm a boomer just by, I just barely made that uh, designation. But anyhow, Keep in mind, 10,000 boomers a day are retiring for the next 20 years. 10,000 a day for the next 20 years, which is a crazy number, right? And then we also have these, um, uh, oh, the, the other thing is, so I'm seeing the commercial side probably getting hit more than anybody, and that would be in the retail and office space in my mind. I don't know that multifamily is going to see it as much as office, for example. Um and then the other piece, uh, construction. Construction still isn't back to the levels it was before the crash. A lot of people don't notice that. I was in construction 22 years, so I do pay attention to that. My oldest son is a contractor. So as a family, we're, we definitely have our finger on that pulse. The um, And then you have these moratoriums, downturns. and um, th Well, the moratoriums, until they lift them, um, it's going to, it, it definitely impacts our business in some ways because it was, it's definitely a revenue cycle for us, but there, um, we are very, uh, aware of that, of the timelines, the cost, we have like a whole matrix for foreclosure timelines and cost. And right now you have COVID impact maps. So I don't know if everybody on the call is aware of that, but I advise you to check out COVID impact maps because it is traveling around the country. Um, the moratoriums aren't the same everywhere. Uh, we have like a whole matrix. So a lot of times you can get some of that stuff from your servicer as well. Uh, but you do want to know what that's looking like. But at some point, all this is going to lift. Uh, well, some of the things we've been doing during this time period to offset some of the revenue. Uh, it's not a decline, necessarily a decline in revenue. It's just a postponement of it. And um, one of the things we're doing is we're selling more notes right now. Um, a lot of our notes are sold through trade desk. And then uh, the other thing is we have a big deed in lieu campaign that we're doing. So it's to circumvent the courthouse process, right? So if you do uh, a big deed in lieu outreach program, it changes the game, right? So there's a lot of things going on. Um, the other thing is um, I have a counterparty that is doing a, just did a recent uh, big securitization. Um, and the, ac the, um, the appetite for that is through the roof. And the other side is you're seeing securitization wind downs, which also bring us opportunity for uh, cheaper product because they must sell, right? So a lot going on out there, um, but I think the recovery is going to be based on the infection rates and uh, the health solution. So we're all in the note business. Uh, before I get too far, I just want to make sure everybody knows what a note is. Uh, it wasn't that long ago I thought a note was... Uh, you know, musical symbol, and I thought alone meant to be all by myself. And but today, uh, a note is a promise to pay, right? And most of the time, I'm talking about a secured note tied to a piece of real estate. 
But I also like to point out that we are all in the note business. And by that, I mean, it's happening all around us, whether we're paying attention to it. So if you look at everything in the room you're sitting in right now, probably everything in that room was financed at one point in time. So you have medical debt, auto debt, uh, mortgage debt, obviously, student loan debt, and it just goes on and on and on and on. So everything around us has been financed. And whether you realize it or not, you're in the note business, whether you know it or not, because you're, you're paying for a product that was financed or you know you had some type of debt and you, you were just writing checks, you just weren't paying attention to it and you never thought about, hey, what if I receive a check instead of, or what if I bought debt at a discount? Like those ideas might not have occurred to some of us, right? But we're all in the note business. And I think, you know, just to point out what our business model is, is, you know, we're, we just pretty much raise capital. We do marketing. We raise capital from high net worth folks. And then um, I turn that money over to my partner, John. John goes out and uh, does all the acquisitions and trading, sourcing a product, underwriting a product, uh, oversees uh, any of our loan sales. And then my other partner, Bob, oversees our asset management and our surveillance. Um, and our portfolio management, and I mentioned REO management that I oversee. So there's an asset management component. Some of PPR is starting to shift these days, though. We're, sh we're shifting more from being an asset manager into being more of a capital management shop. Um, and we do more outsourcing uh, than we do asset management in-house. We're starting to do more with some of our JV partners and things like that. So why invest in notes, right? No toilets, no tenants, no inspections, no contractors. And you know what they say about contractors, because I know I was one. They're worse than the tenants, right? So there's a lot of pros and cons to doing the note business, but I wanted to go over some of them. And I know this is a smart audience. Some of these you may know, but I just want to point out the way I kind of look at some of this, right? So it is passive cash flow, right? And it's truly passive, right? It's different than like real estate. They say real estate's passive, but I don't know that it is. Uh, when I was a property manager and I was in court every week and, you know, if you get a phone call, you know, that you got bed bugs or something, it doesn't feel passive, even though the IRS is telling you it is. With notes, it truly is passive in most cases, especially with performing notes or if you're in a note fund. Um, volume and control, right? Banks figured this out a long time ago. Um, Bank of America would rather have 30 million um, mortgages than 30 million properties, right? And um, it's profitable in various market conditions. I mentioned some of those, like how we shifted into the deed and lose space. When it's a high equity market, notes are in direct correlation to real estate values. And when values are up, right, it deed and lose no problem. Now, if it goes the other way and the market, real estate market were to crash, uh, deed and lose are not as favorable, right? So they go in and out of style based on what the market's doing. Um, and you just have to shift your strategies just like you would if you were in the real estate business. But it's uh, the other thing I like a pro is that there's collateral, right? One of the things that turned me on most about notes when I started was anytime I can invest in an asset with a high yield with collateral, I don't know, that was kind of sexy to me. And, um, you know, I'm a guy that did a lot of different things. And uh, I used to trade options, for example. And that was one of the things. There's no collateral, right? And that's what I liked about this business, the collateral component, um, especially with secure debt. And then it's versatile. Pretty much anything you can do with a house, um, you can do with a note, right? I can uh, rehab the note. I can borrow against the note. I can flip the note. You get the idea. Um, and then there's also a socially conscious investing component to it where you're able to help homeowners stay in their home and modify their loan. You know, Maybe you can extend the term or lower the interest rate, those types of things. And if it's a vacant property, you know, I, I deal with a lot of vacant REO property myself. Um, you know, I feel good about some of the community stabilization we're doing, where we're trying to get properties uh, back on the tax rolls, that kind of thing. And no one wants a boarded up house with high grass on their street, right? And uh, my goal is to get that through the system as quickly as possible, right? So what are some of the disadvantages of notes? And of course, no one likes to talk about these, right? Um, in some ways, there's limited tax breaks, right? You don't really have true depreciation uh, in the note business. It's just not a characteristic of this asset class. Um, but um, you can invest in notes through qualified plans, though, and uh, tend to avoid taxes that way. So one of the things I do as a, you know, personally as an investor, 
you know, I have short-term, mid-term, long-term investments. I have liquid, illiquid investments. I have high-risk, low-risk investments. Then I have tax-advantaged and not as tax-advantaged investments. And I earmark my capital based on where it's coming from and the cost of that capital into various investment classes. So I try to marry those two together and, um, you know, kind of fill all these different buckets, so to speak. Uh, there's also no true appreciation, right? You can't buy a note for 50 grand and 10 years from now it's worth a hundred grand, but there is what we call phantom appreciation. And by phantom appreciation, that might be where I bought a non-performing note at a discount. Um, and maybe the, uh, equity in the property behind that note went up. So real estate values went up, the equity improved. Well, all of a sudden my note became more valuable. Well, then I call that phantom appreciation. And then there's another form of phantom appreciation through pay history. So I might have had a note that was non-performing, got it re-performing. Um, and if it's paying for 12 months or 24 months, all of a sudden that note's more valuable. Well, I didn't really do anything. They just, you know, just made their payments. And over that pay history actually increased the value of the asset. Um, and then there's uh, the borrower can sometimes decide the exit. Now, it doesn't mean you can't. You could sell your note. You could sell a partial. You can borrow against a note with a collateral assignment, a note mortgage, right? So those decisions I'm making or you're making, um, but if the borrower decides to get divorced, well, that's out of my control or they or they, you know, pass away, they you know, settle the estate. I can't control some of that. But really, you just go back to market and you would reinvest or invest in something else. And then foreclosure sometimes is looked at as a negative, probably due to cost or um you know, but but the one thing that foreclosure does do is it does clear the title, and and that can be an advantage sometimes. But I think if you're in the non-performing note business, especially, and you don't have capital set aside to handle demand letters and foreclosure, then you shouldn't be in the business. That's part of the business. Um, and then the other one is it is heavily regulated, so there is a little bit of a high barrier to entry. Um, it's a capital intensive business. Um, and in a lot of states, there's probably close to a dozen states that require licensing just to buy, hold, or sell. Um, I'm not a licensing expert. It's not really my uh, expertise, but I know it exists. And you just want to be aware of it. You just don't want to get yourself in trouble with some of that stuff. So where do you find these notes, right? There's online sources, you know, the auction.coms, the loan MLS, the paper stacks, the uh, there's note brokers like the Mountain Views and Colonial Fundings and things like that. And you have loan exchanges like um, Exchange X or Nilex or DebtX. And you have note funds, right? PPR is a note fund. You have AMIP, you have Granite, you have PRP. These are all note funds. Watermark, I mean, they go, it goes on and on and on, right? There's tons of note funds. You have banks and servicing companies and government agencies, right? And um, there's even services like Distress Pro out there that will tell you uh, where all the distressed debt is and who has it all. So there's a lot of neat things out there. And then you also have um, private sellers, right? The Donna Bowers, she's here today. Um, the Donna Bowers, the Pete Fortunatos, the Jeff Armstrongs, right? They all have, um, you know, they're in the, uh, I call it the seller finance business. There's really two note worlds, the seller finance note world and the institutional note world. I just happen to play in the institutional space, right? So... Why do people stop paying, right? And it's really four main reasons. It's death, divorce, job loss, and medical. Um, sometimes uh, people go, well, there's strategic defaults too. Yeah, but they're also illegal, and they're not really the main four reasons why people default. So, um, you know, that, that's it. And that's why I was saying earlier the biggest one is uh, unemployment, right? That's the big one that seems to shift the most uh, to impact our business. So modification programs, right? Um, just want to give you a little flavor of how that works. If you're not used to that, uh, typically asset managers will reach out to uh, a delinquent borrower, especially when it's occupied. And they, they have conversations with the borrower where um, they tell stories of other homeowners they've helped. And they don't tell them what to do. They just start to lay out some options of what other folks have done to remedy their situation. So the conversation might go like this. Hey, we had a family in Oregon where they were able to access their 401k penalty free because they were in arrears on their mortgage. Is that something that may interest you? And the borrower may say something like, well, I don't have a 401k, right? <laughs> 
Um, or they might say they do, but if they say they don't, then we go into the next one. We say, well, we have a fa friends and family program. You know, we had a, um, a borrower in Delaware where um, the gal was able to borrow money from, or her, her uncle was able to purchase her junior lien from the bank. Is that something that may, may interest you? Um, and, and they might say, well, I don't have any friends or family. Uh, you know, I don't know. Everybody hates me. And then we will go down the list. We'll go, well, do you have an insurance contract? Do you have uh, an income tax check? We have a whole, they have a whole list of things they'll go over. And really what it comes down to is the more money that uh, a borrower can put towards arrears or back taxes, uh, the more favorable payment plan that you can come up with, especially if you bought the asset at a discount. And really what you're doing as the asset manager is you're sharing the discount you got from the bank uh, with the borrower to hopefully modify the situation, whether that is to extend the term or the lower the interest rates. And um, I'm, hopefully I'm going to show you uh, a couple of case studies like this uh, where you can see some of these types of situations. I'm going to uh, show you. Uh, a junior lien and a couple of first liens and uh, go through a couple examples. So, but there, I do want to point out that there are some pretty significant differences between junior liens and first liens. And I just don't want to see anyone get hurt from that. Uh, what we look at for first mortgages versus second mortgages is completely different. In fact, the philosophy is different. The strategy is different. The way they're sold is different. The way you do workouts is different. The due diligence is different. And I just want to point that out because if you're using first mortgage tax tactics on junior liens, it's not going to end well. And if you use junior lien tactics on first mortgages, it's not going to end well. So just to give you some color, um, most of the time with first mortgages, you're exiting through the property. And with junior liens, you're usually exiting through the borrower. First mortgages a lot of times are sold based on fair market value and equity and geography and location and sticks and bricks. Second liens, they're sold on UPB and it's very statistical, right? Um, and then even when you do a modification with junior liens, you're usually addressing arrears. With first mortgages, you're usually addressing back taxes, right? And on the due diligence side with first mortgages, you know, you're doing like lien report, lien and encumbrance reports, things like that. Junior lien, you're pulling credit, right? And first liens, we're usually not pulling credit unless we're buying a performing loan or something. So, what, and then that's the other thing. If you're buying performing or non-performing, your due diligence is different as well. So I just don't want to see folks get hurt and um, make sure they realize there are significant differences. Make sure you know what that is before you venture into that space. Because, you know, I don't want to see anyone get uh, in trouble with some of that stuff. So I wanted to do a couple quick case studies of deals we did recently. Here's one in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, which isn't too far from me. I'm outside Philadelphia. This is uh, on the Jersey side of Philly. And um, what was interesting about this, we purchased it back in September of 2019 for $136,900. And we were forecasted to get out of this deal in March of 2021. Now, this was a first mortgage Heckam loan that we had bought from HUD. And Heckam is, um, it's a reverse mortgage where the borrower, borrower was deceased. So I know uh, it's a weird animal, but when you're buying these reverse mortgages where the borrowers are deceased, you're really, you're pretty much buying properties that you have to take through foreclosure. And the one thing that's tough about New Jersey, it's a long timeline, right? So um but one of the things we did to speed this particular deal up is that we um, took it through, um, what do they call that? Um, uh, we actually uh, took it through receivership. And you can do that a lot of times when the borrower is deceased and there's no executor or no administrator. So we were able to actually circumvent some of the courthouse process and really speed things up. So what was cool about this, we were able to um, sell this. We actually had like 14 offers on this thing for two ninety five five cash as is. And you can see we netted a lot of money in less than a year. And we did have some expenses. I mean, we had to do, we literally filled like four dumpsters on this thing to clean it out. I think it was about 5,500 to do that. So think about how much we sped that up from a forecasted sale date of March of 2021 
and the actual sale date was July 28th. Yeah, not too far, um, not too many months ago. Um, so you can see that it's pretty good ROI on something like that. Um, now, not every deal is like that, but we did have like 14 offers. Uh, here's another one we did recently in Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, we purchased in 2019 for 97000 and change. Um, and our sale date was in July uh, also of 2020. And this was a, a deal where the forecasted exit amount um, was like 133 grand, but we actually were able to exit for 166,000 and we had a 6,000 assist because we sold at FHA. But here's where the hang up was. We were having a little bit of trouble at first selling this because usually we try to sell everything as is. We, we hope to not rehab anything almost. But this happened to be in an FHA neighborhood. A lot of the buyers were FHA. So we had to make a decision. Do we put a roof on this or not? And, um, you know, the I think the roof was like eight grand. And we were like, oh, do we do it or not? But the cool part was as soon as we were done the roof, we had an offer in, within five days. So it really paid us to do that. So for an $8,000 investment, we actually netted an additional 15 grand and it helped us uh, liquidate the asset that much quicker. So sometimes it we do partial repairs, um, especially to uh, sometimes we'll do enough repairs to get a CO or a use and occupancy. So here's a sample of a, a junior lien, a <clears throat> little bit different animal. Um, you know, this was uh, purchase price was 13,000 and change. The original note was 98 grand. Uh, the payment was 622. The unpaid principal balance was 82,000 at 631. And you can see the interest rate was 7.625, 240 months, 20 year, 20 year uh, second lien. And the first mortgage was 662 and the fair market value was 700 grand. So really not even enough equity to fully cover this. What was interesting about this deal was they hadn't made a payment for 10 years. Crazy, right? Hadn't made a payment in 10 years. Um. Uh, their actual next due date was December 1st of 2008. Can you imagine? Um, but we purchased this back in December of 18. Um, and some of the highlights was, you know, PPR sent out a demand letter. The borrower filed a QWR, which is a qualified written request, which is basically they're disputing that they still even own this junior lien. And they were trying to act like, well, I didn't have it anymore. I refinanced my first or whatever they were trying to say. So they actually hired counsel and they, but, the good news there is when they do do that, it um, we prefer that actually because when they hire counsel, it's kind of like a voice of reason in the negotiations uh, to get them to come to the table of a new agreement and modification. And that's exactly what happened in this deal in Riverside. And, um, you know, we just modified the loan. They had a new payment of 926. Uh, they had a new UPB because you can imagine if you don't make payments, the interest and late fees and penalties. Um, are pretty dramatic. There's cases where it's more than the original loan amount, uh, the arrears and stuff. So we lowered that uh, for them because they had made a discounted arrears payment of 25 grand. So we actually discounted their arrears and then set a new UPB. Um, and then it was a new 20 year term and we lowered the interest rate a little bit to seven and a half on this. And um, we let this deal season, which means they made payments for 12 months. And then we actually sold the loan um, for 92.6. So total revenue was $128,712, including the arrears, the 12 months payments. Uh, we did have some legal fees of 4,500, but you can see a pretty significant profit off, uh, this particular junior lien. And, um, sometimes a larger junior lien, especially in California, you know, you'll see numbers like this. Now, some people will ask me, Hey Dave, is every deal like this? No, of course not. We have deals where we don't make any money, right? Uh, especially with junior liens. Uh, it's very statistical. You know, if you have a hundred quality junior liens, um, by that, I mean, they're probably current on their first mortgage. We'll typically have a favorable outcome on about 42 ish, um, out of that hundred. And you just don't know which ones they are until you dig into them. So it's, um, <clears throat> I tell people, it's like when I used to sell insurance, out of 100 men by age 65, 36 are dead. We just don't know which 36. Well, that's the second mortgage space, right? Very statistical um, like that. And it's just the, the nature of the beast, right? So what are some ways to get started in notes, right? 
Uh, performing notes is one. I know PPR sells performing notes with a warranty. Uh, some people like that. Um, but a lot of times, you know, one of the questions I ask people when they're getting started into the note business is what kind of investor are you? You know, it's a great question. What kind of investor are you? What kind of time commitment do you have? What's your background? What's your education? How, you know, how much capital do you have? All these are variables because even if I told you what my outcomes were, as an asset manager, I haven't been an asset manager in a long time, but um, doesn't mean you would have the same outcomes I would because maybe we have a different background or different uh, approach or who knows. So it, it does matter uh, as to what kind of investor are you? Are you passive? Are you active? Those types of things. Then you have note funds. Um, one of the things that people like about note funds is it's a way to invest uh, with some diversification. It's very passive, has limited liability. Um, now there's some no funds where you have to be high net worth like PPRs, or there's, um, some that do crowdfunding. So you don't have to be high net worth, right? So there's various types of no funds, <clears throat> but you're really investing in, I tell people you're investing in shares of a non-publicly traded company when you invest in a note fund typically. And, um, you just got to know the management team. That's what you're really investing in. Uh, but the advantage there is they might have access to product that you don't. They might have expertise that you don't, all those kinds of things. And then you have non-performing notes. Uh, you absolutely want to utilize a servicer with non-performing. Um, not telling you to do it or not do it. I'm just saying know what you're doing if you do do it. Um, and a lot of times I'll tell folks that you don't necessarily have to invest your capital uh, in the beginning, especially when you're new. You can shadow someone else's deal you can partner with someone else. You know, there's a lot of, uh, there's a whole multitude of ways that you can get started. Um, you can also get started with uh, safer deals. You, maybe you invest in first mortgages instead of second mortgages, or maybe you invest in high equity deals, or um, maybe you invest in performing notes first, right? There's a lot of ways to, um, you know, invest in, uh, you know, high equity, you know, all, all these different um ways to invest uh, in a little bit safer ways, right? You can invest in hard money at first, right? That was one of the ways I started out with private and hard money um, and seller financing. That was the other way that I started. Uh, I just mentioned, I mentioned my deal at the beginning, um, but I started doing seller financing, gosh, a long time ago, probably 20 years ago. Um, Cause I've been a realtor like 33 years now, something crazy. But the um, I remember uh, holding second mortgages when I would sell one of my properties to another investor. Um, I had first mortgages on rental properties as well. I still have mortgages today that I collect on from years ago. Uh, it's cool to cash flow off properties you no longer own. So seller financing is a great way to get started. Um, and, and private and hard money, you'll see even a lot of real estate investors when they get up, you know, I have a buddy that has like 500 houses. He has a big hard money company in the area. Um, you know, he puts a commercial line on his portfolio. And next thing you know, he's a hard money lender. Uh, you'll see a lot of people do that. It's kind of funny how real successful, uh, some real successful real estate investors end up in the hard money business. Um, you have peer to peer lending, like the lending clubs of the world or the prosper.coms. You can get in the note business with 20 bu 25 bucks. You know, it doesn't take a ton of money. Um, and you can invest in receivables as well, which is like merchant cash advance. I actually do that. I have a small fund that does merchant cash advance and we do some other stuff too, ATM machines and all kinds of stuff. So there's a lot of ways to get started in the note business. And um, you can even do this too. A lot of people, you know, I tell folks to invest in what they know uh, sometimes and, um, you could be, by that I mean, like um, I had a heating and air conditioning guy said, um, you know, have you ever thought of financing the installation of the heaters in your business? He goes, oh, you can do that? There's a company that does that. I said, yeah, did you ever think of owning it? Right? And think about that. He gets a deposit to install the heater. If they don't pay him, he can put a mechanics lien on the property, right? So there's a lot of ways to get into the note business. Um, I have a dentist buddy who does the same things. He finances the dental work. And now his dental finance company is worth more than his practice today. So there's a lot of ways to get into note business. You can create notes, originate notes. There's a lot of things. You don't have to do it exactly the way Dave's doing it, right? There's a lot. Invest in what you know sometimes. So notes versus note funds. Um, I get this question a lot as to, you know, which is better. 
And to be honest with you, I haven't figured it out and I do both. <laughs> so I have no portfolio. I invest in notes. Uh, I invest in hard money deals. Uh, I also invest in note funds, right? So I'm doing a, a little bit of both. They are different investments. Uh, when you invest in a note, uh, anyone can buy a note. You don't have to usually be a high net worth investor or anything. Whereas note funds, uh, you may have to be high net worth uh, in some cases. Uh, with a note, it's usually interest income or a long-term or short-term capital gain when you liquidate or exit that note. And with note funds, you're typically getting a K-1, which is usually ordinary income. And sometimes there's interest income in there, um, but it's usually very passive in a note fund. Um, so just some of the differences there. The one cool thing that we do with like PPR's funds is you have the ability to compound your returns. And right now, PPR has a, um, an income fund and a liquidity fund. And if you're in our income fund, uh, we, we do have a 10% fund that opens up once in a while. And uh, our current fund investors get preferred access. But like, for example, if you were to compound, a, it's a three-year term at 10%. And if you compound that, you actually make 11.6. So that just shows you the power of co a compounded return. And in our income fund, uh, they invest primarily in, um, what do you call it, non-performing mortgages, primarily first. Um, so we typically get yields anywhere from 18 to 20, low 20s on, on those returns. Um, and, um, you know, that's a $50,000 minimum, 5000 a share. And we cap investors at a million dollars per EIN number. And then we have a liquidity fund, which is shorter term. Uh, currently, we have a six-month term at 6%. And in that fund, the minimum is only $25,000, $5,000 a share, million-dollar uh, maximum per EIN number. And then, um, and that's backed primarily by reperforming mortgages with the coupon, usually north of 12%. So you can see that spread. That's how that fund actually makes money. Um, but it just shows you the power of those compounded returns. So any of these funds you can compound. We do have an 8% one-year option in our income fund if somebody's looking for shorter term. So one of the cool things about um, note funds is they kind of fill a niche or a void. You know, there's some investment funds that only last a year. It could be tax liens or hard money or whatever. Then you have us in this six-month to three-year window. And then you'll see syndications. You know, I do a lot of stuff with uh, multifamily syndication, for example, where the terms are longer. It could be three years, five years, seven years, sometimes even 10 years. Um, you never know. Um, so there's different ones and some of those real estate funds will have tax advantages where we don't have as many. And then you have, um, you know, there's different types of investment categories, so to speak. So I don't necessarily recommend any one over another. I like them all. So I'll just tell you the truth. Um, so one of the things, uh, today, if, uh, anybody's interested in learning more about, uh, node investing, we do have a free ebook introduction to note investing. If you go to pprnoco.com forward slash welcome, you can actually um, get a copy of this. Uh, you could sign up for our email newsletter and get notes in your inbox every week. Um, and there's probably, I'm trying to think where else people can connect with us on uh, bigger pockets. Uh, we answer questions daily on bigger pockets for note investors. There's actually a note, um, section like a, a group on bigger pockets where people can ask no questions we answer them all the time and then we also have a distressed mortgages group on linkedin we answer questions there pretty much daily anytime anybody has a question we try to help out but by all means try to get a copy of the ebook if you're interested in just starting out i also had written a book on bigger pockets here we go i don't know if you can see it real estate note investing um if you want to do a little bit deeper dive into uh, node investing and kind of the journey that it talks about the journey I had uh, throughout my life of being a real estate investor and morphing into the node space. So would love to open it up to some questions. I'm hoping I can see this chat. Here's some contact info for me. Um, let me see if I can stop sharing and see the chat right now i can't see any comments oh here's a bunch all right let me see 
What should I do now in the market? That's Leslie. She was asking that earlier. That's a good question. Um, well, you see what I'm doing. I'm selling some properties because it is a seller's market. You know, I had two offers on my whole portfolio. One was out of Brooklyn. One was a local uh, younger investor who I, you know, was friends with, who's actually going through with the the sale. And uh, it was funny. Both offers were similar. And um, you know, it just was a good time to sell for me. Um, I don't know when the market will be this good again. You know, um, I might have to wait five or ten years to get the execution I'm, I'm kind of getting right now. And it's a good deal for the buyer too because they're getting good financing. So um, what you should do in this market, I know sometimes people go, when do I jump in in the market, in a down market or an up market? Um, you know, I wish I had some of the assets we had after the crash in 07. Um, the note business, especially the non-performing space, I mean, we uh, we have a field day when it's a down market. That's all I could say. Uh, but we kind of make money in all markets. So it's just shift of strategy, really. Um, views on the current economy. I told some of those. How can a wholesaler buy and hold investor leverage their business with note buying? Um, you know, that's a great question. Uh, Gigi asked. And for me, one of the things I re I'm gonna say regret, but yeah, I guess it is a regret. I wish I had incorporated leverage sooner when I was younger. Cause you know, I used to have a, we buy houses business as well. And, um, I'll give you an example. I always tried to use my own capital or my own lines of credit, which looking back was like dumb. Like, why did I wait? Right. I could have used hard money or private money and accelerated my business. Another, th another thing I did was I used, I would use my, I, at one point I had 11 lines of credit on my properties. Right. And I'm a guy that started out buying houses with credit cards. So I've always used leverage to get to the next level. But when I was using the lines of credit, I would use them for more real estate deals. And looking back, that was a big mistake. I should have just used private money and hard money for, for real estate deals and use my lines of credit for more liquid, uh, safer investments, right? Because um, you don't want to tie up your money in you know, a longer term real estate deal is actually, there's risk to that. Um, I had a buddy that was a plumber that did that. He borrowed money out of his primary residence to do a local rehab deal. And then he had a heart attack was out of work for nine months, almost lost the house he lived in over access in the line of credit, as opposed if he had used the hard money lender, he could have just given the house back and he wouldn't have damaged his credit or anything. So you got to be really careful when you're doing that. The other thing is, if you do both, think about it. You might pay a little bit higher interest rate, but it's short term. Do it. Because here's why. You can grow your portfolio twice as fast, right? Because I can go invest in, I can take my line of credit and go invest in notes or hard money deals or whatever. And then I can use private money to do my real estate deals. Well, now I'm growing twice as fast. I'm building wealth twice as fast and I'm doing it safer. So a lot of people, you know, they, they look at just interest rate and they go, yeah, but the line of credit is 3% and the hard money guy is more. So what? The hard money guy is going to force you to get the deal done on time. That's what he's going to do. And you can do both. Right. So Think about the safety and the risk, not just the rate, you know. Um, but there's a lot of things you can do note buying. You know, I had a buddy that was, he's got a couple hundred houses, right? And um, I was out to lunch with him one day and he's like, he, he's telling me he started out doing 39 hard money deals in the beginning. I'm like, that's insane. That's a lot of money. Why would you do that? And he goes, no, it wasn't that bad. It became easier. I get more favorable terms over time. It was just a phone call. I get the money. And he goes, the other side of that was I was making money on the draw. And I go, what the heck's that? I never heard of making money on the draw. He goes, well, if the next draw was 10 grand and I did the work with my crew for six grand, I pocketed four grand tax free. And then when I went to go refi, they saw the full hard money amount. And I'm like, that's brilliant. I never thought of that. So all that time I was focused on hard money being too expensive. Boy, was I dumb and missed the boat. I could have been doing way more deals than I was doing. Right. And it's definitely one of my regrets is that I didn't use more leverage and hard money sooner and heavier than, than I did. Um, you know, I kind of waited to use my own money with the cheaper money, you know, that kind of thing. So, all right. Um, enough of that. I beat you up enough on that. Can you talk about peer to peer for 25 bucks? Um, yeah, actually, I'm, I'm actually liquidating a lot of my lending club. Uh, there's a, a gal nearby, uh, Deepta. I don't know if anybody on the call knows Deepta, but Deepta is a 
pretty savvy lending club investor. Um, and then we had some guys that are good on the analytics at PPR, especially the younger folks who didn't have a lot of capital to, they're not high net worth investors yet, but they would get the, they would scrub the analytics off lending club. And there's some sweet spots in there. Like I'll give you an example, reperforming notes in lending club that are, uh, nine months performing, have a much lower default rate. Right. So, you know, there's this categories you can determine over time. Um, but you can, um, you know, for me in the beginning of lending club, I put money in a lot of different categories to see how it was shaken out. And then I kind of found my, uh, my sweet spot, but I don't do too much today for a while there. It was like my new Facebook, you know, I was in lending club like every day, but, um, you can invest, uh, a P you're investing your 20 or 25 bucks into a piece of a note and they're unsecured notes similar to credit card debt, but you're spreading your risk around and it's based on credit score. So if they default, they ruin their credit, but it, it would be like investing in credit card debt pretty much. Um, if you have a budget of 50 grand, looks like the safest return is from a fund. Well, it depends on the fund manager. There are funds that don't do well and there's funds that go out of business. So you're in investing in a company. Um, if you invest in the note, you actually have the collateral, but then it's not as passive as well. Now, it can be pretty passive. I mean, my mom's just turned 88, and she's like a little note queen, and she has some notes, um, but they're serviced by the servicer. If something ever happens to me, the servicer can foreclose just as much as, uh, you know, me or PPR could. So um, that's kind of the back. It's one of the things my wife never, you know, my wife sometimes will say to me, don't you die and leave me all those junk properties you own, you own. but she never says that about my note portfolio because she sees the money coming in the bank every month. And she realizes there's a servicer behind it if something ever happened to me. Uh, plus, my son's in the note business, too. But you get the idea. Um, what's the note tied to? Um, it depends on what kind of note it is. Um, it's tied to the house in the first or second. Um, so that's a lot of good questions, guys. I don't know if my time is up. But like I said, if you do have any other questions, you can hit me at info at pprnoco.com. Um, I have an investor relations team. Feel free to call in or you can go to pprnoco.com and ask a question on that site or on Bigger Pockets, or on the Distress Mortgages Group on LinkedIn. And uh, <clears throat> just want to thank everyone for uh, joining me today. I know I talk fast like a guy from the Northeast, but... Uh, Hopefully I wasn't too fast and hopefully you were able to understand um, most of the things I was talking about today and uh, really appreciate you guys uh, jumping on today. And uh, thanks again. Thanks for joining. And uh, hopefully this was informative and uh, we can stay in touch. Thanks, guys.